I'm your host, Kaylee, and this is Rebel Wellness. You've just tuned in to Rebel Wellness, the podcast that's here to revolutionize your approach to personal health and well-being. I'm your host, Kaylee, also known as Coach Kales, and I'm thrilled to have you join our Rebel community. In a world that's saturated with fleeting diet trends and unrealistic beauty standards, we believe it's time for serious change. Our mission is simple yet profound, to empower women like you to break free from the confines of today's diet culture and embrace a holistic approach to health that's sustainable for the long haul. If you're like me, you're here to embrace the concept that true well-being encompasses every facet of your life, mind, body, and soul. Rebels believe in aligning our journey with our individual needs and values because a one-size-fits-all approach just simply doesn't cut it anymore. This podcast is your safe space to explore the depths of wellness guided by myself, experts, real life stories, and genuine commitment to your growth. You're here to begin your transformative journey, and it's time to discover your own version of balance in your health. Every week when you tune into Rebel Wellness, we'll learn, grow, and rebel against the polarizing outdated norms to finally achieve lasting vitality and joy. Because that sounds pretty great, right? Your journey starts now, and I am so excited that you're here. Hello, and welcome back, Rebel. I'm so glad you are here. Welcome to the show. This is our second installment of our Best of the Rebellion, as we're calling it, (laughs) Um, that is heading into the best clips from our fitness chats. So if you are new here, welcome. I want to let you know that this entire month is chock full of little tidbits and clips from some of our top episodes and uh, listener favorited episodes of this last year in 2023 for Rebel Wellness. And it is honestly, it's so hard to pick some of these clips, guys. Like I have been just searching through so many little things and being like, should I put this one? Should I put that one? So hopefully I am hitting some really great topics that these have been interesting you in episodes you haven't listened to yet and that are helping you better learn multi topics in each of these categories. So today you're about to listen to some of the top clips from our fitness chats. This one really is super important to me because I, as you know, spent the last decade of my life being a professional fitness trainer and fitness is such a big passion for me. It's been something that I have really grown and explored and seen the most change for a lot of my clientele as they kind of intro into my take on health through the mode of fitness, because that's usually how people find me and reach out and then It's kind of funny because then I end up getting to know them a little better and we get a little deeper and then we go into nutrition and mindset and it just is a whole lifestyle change. And I love all of that, but fitness is always our entry. And I think that some of the advice and information and tips in general that come out of this series are some of my favorite. And I think they should be absolute game changers for you if you are new to fitness, or maybe even just been doing fitness for a while, but you've never had like a professional's take on different areas in fitness, like from group classes to strength training to cardio, you know, there's a whole lot to continue to learn individually and kind of debunk, as you know, is my favorite thing to do. So I hope that you guys really enjoy today's little bundle I guess the last episode, I called them snacks from each of our best episodes. So I would love to hear your feedback if you did, or I'd love to hear if you go and explore some of these other episodes, because some of these ones in today's are from really early, very early Rebel Wellness. (laughs) And sometimes I'm like, oh, it's a little bit cringe to listen to some of my early podcasts. But I mean, hey, it's a journey, right? It's a journey for all of us. So um, it's honestly sometimes a little bit fun or a lot of it fun to kind of hear how we have transitioned. My podcast and I were just talking about that. So I hope that you enjoy this. But as always, I would love for you to come join us on Instagram at Rebel Wellness Podcast for our Rebel Wellness, all the things, and at Kaylee Loren for my flagship coaching page. Lots of great topics that I like to share and post on that is encompassing all the things health that you are listening to here on Rebel Wellness. So it's a great 
page to come join my community there. That is my oldest community. It's my established Coach Kales page. It used to be coached by Kales. So if you're looking for that and you find Kaylee Loren, you're in the right place. But I would also invite you to come join our newsletter on our website. We launched the first one this month and they're jam packed with a bunch of my favorites, anything nutrition, fitness. I even like to create resources for you for free that I usually only exclusively give to my newsletter subscribers and things down the line that I have as offerings for you and some DIY courses and such are on their way in 2024. You do not want to miss that. Come join coachkills.com. Awesome things on their way there. But without further ado, let's get into the best clips of our fitness chats. We're going to be talking all things from hit to micro workouts to glute muscle building tips, bodybuilders, cycle syncing, working out with your cycle, and uh, some thoughts about the scale because I do feel like that needs to be involved in this fitness conversation because it's kind of one of those things that we tend to watch the most, especially when we are weight training. And it's so important to know really well-rounded understanding of what the scale actually means. So I had to slide that guy in there because it is super important. And that was definitely a favorite for a lot of the listeners that that episode is awesome. Episode 42 Definitely recommend you check that one out, but you'll hear a little clip of it here today. So let's jump right in. All right. So when we think about HIIT classes or HIIT training in general, the main goal that I usually see a lot of us fitness professionals see is that most people are trying to change their body composition. Your body composition is your percentage of your body between your lean mass, your total body fat, and other tissues that go into your body, such as your water, your blood, etc. So when we talk about body composition, we're kind of just looking at your bones, body fat, and muscle. That's the main categories we're looking for. When people want to improve their body composition, they're typically looking to reduce their body fat percentage and increase their lean muscle. Sometimes most general population has a goal to just reduce their overall weight. That can include body fat and muscle, which is not ideal because anytime you lose muscle, you're lowering your metabolic rate, AKA how many calories you're burning at rest. So I always tell my clients, if you are looking to improve your body for health reasons and aesthetics, you really want to aim on reducing body fat percentage overall and increasing lean muscle mass. So when people are looking to do something like F45, spin classes, 75 hard, CrossFit, Orange Theory, typically their overall goal tends to be they're trying to burn as much fat as possible. Other times people are just looking for a good drip, so to speak. They're just trying to get a good sweat on. I would argue that most of those people are still looking for the quote unquote benefits of fat loss. So while there's a lot of different reasons somebody would be taking these different classes, um, including CrossFit. I would say CrossFit is a lot more performance-based, so you don't always find people that are just trying to get a fat burn workout going to CrossFit. Usually you'll see it though with Orange Theory, F45, all of those different kind of circuit training classes and spin class, etc. But before I chat about my take on each of those different groups and their methodologies, it's important for you to understand what HIT actually is. So HIIT is high intensity interval training. This is essentially periods of maximal effort paired with light exercise or rest. We're really looking for you to go balls to the wall, high intensity during that set of time. And then when you're in your rest period, that should immediately follow. You should probably be doing an intensely reduced rest phase. So usually I would say you should be almost doing no movement or a slow walk. So this is sometimes, for example, you'll see people doing this on the treadmill where you're sprinting and then you're walking or you're standing with your feet on the rails. So it's really important to kind of understand the three energy metabolism systems that our bodies use. And it is depending on intensity and duration of the exercise itself. The first category is going to be called the phosphocreatine system. And this is your full force exertion system. So it's kind of Essentially, if you were to fight or flight, something scares the crap out of you, you jump up and sprint away. 
that's going to be your phosphocreatine system. It's immediate response to a stimulus. Glycolysis is in between. You're relatively high intensity, but you can also sustain that energy output for about a minute or two. Extended long periods of strain is going to be something that you can sustain for a while. That would be your beta oxidation system. This is what we see when we're doing any type of like running, hiking, walking, any cardio really that you're sustaining for a long period of time, that's beta oxidation. This is the one where basically you hear all of these like things on social media or ads where they say that fat is oxidative, so you must do cardio. Yes and no. It's kind of like the whole calories in, calories out argument. Generally, it makes sense. Generally, it is true by physics and such. However, it isn't the fastest way or the most effective long-term method for fat loss, fat burn, etc. And I'm going to tell you why. So the first two systems I spoke about, phosphocreatine and glycolysis, they don't need oxygen the way that beta oxidation does. This doesn't mean that they don't burn fat. This is the segue into what we refer to in the fitness industry as EPOC, which is excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption. The concept of this is basically when you're exercising, you will breathe more to provide oxygen to the working muscles. And then after you exercise, you'll continue to inspire more than normal to make up for what was used during exercise to return the body to homeostasis. So essentially for hours after exercise, you're increasing your caloric expenditure because now you are consuming more oxygen than before the exercise. And that in turn burns calories more calories than if you were to do like nothing at all. So this is the mechanism that's going on when basically people have said HIIT training is great because you burn more calories after you do it. Yes, because of EPOC and the fact that you are utilizing typically more of your muscles for the work that is asked in the exercise versus just running straight forward, etc. So now that you hopefully can kind of understand the basic concepts surrounding the three energy systems that are involved with your metabolism during exercise, it's also important to understand that true high intensity interval training should max out at 20 to 30 minutes of exercise. If it exceeds that, you are really not working to the capacity that's required for activating these physiological benefits. When you supersede the 30 minutes of exercise, you're now kind of shifting into that beta oxidation energy system, which isn't where you're going to get that overall limited capacity for the phosphocreatine system. They also refer to this as the ATPPC because it's also adenosine triphosphate and phosphocreatine system. However, a lot of times we just refer to it as the phosphocreatine. Utilizing that system and only that system is really where you're going to get that fat burn dominant reaction from the body compared to now shifting into like the endurance long distance running type of energy system that can also backfire if you're somebody who already has high cortisol and especially for those females who have high cortisol and high estrogen, long bouts of cardio are not going to stimulate your body to drop fat. But if you do want to strategically try to test this ATP PC system for you, it would be good for you to try like true hit. So again, should not be exceeding 20 to 30 minutes of doing these exercises. Honestly, if you're doing really true hit, 10 to 20 minutes is all you need. And that's also why it became so popular is that it's a really effective way to challenge your body at a capacity that will stimulate fat loss, but in a short amount of time. So a lot of people who have really busy schedules fit into a category where this is really effective for the goals that they're looking for. So you might be wondering, how do I incorporate HIIT properly for those benefits then? So there's kind of like two different ways to approach it. There might be something you've heard called Tabata. This is a method of HIIT training, but not all HIIT is Tabata. So Tabata training is breaking a workout down into like the clearly defined intervals 20 seconds of push it to the limit exercise followed by 10 seconds of rest. That's it. Back to back. It's really short bursts and really short rests. It's extremely intense. So if you can do more than the eight consecutive 
rounds of the work and relax cycles, you're probably not pushing yourself to that limit that you really need to be in. So again, like you need to be going all out, like a tiger is chasing you type of all out for eight consecutive cycles in a four minute round. You are gonna wanna take a full minute of recovery after each round and do a maximum of three to four of those rounds. You should not be exceeding 20 minutes of Tabata. You should be gassed. (laughs) If you don't want to do the Tabata type, you can do a standard hit. And I truly would say you should probably not exceed one to three times per week doing a, a true hit workout. But I would suggest you do sort of a one to five work to rest ratio. So essentially that would be like 10 seconds of all out work, 50 seconds of rest. Sometimes people like to follow the 20 seconds of work, 60 seconds of rest. Whichever you want to do in that one to five ratio is kind of the best way to essentially spike your heart rate to almost max and then let it drop down as much as possible. And this is going to be really healthy for challenging your cardiovascular system because it increases the limits of your heart's capacity to take on higher intense shifts in your body's need for oxygen capacity. This is where we see benefits for people's VO2 max, which is a person's maximal oxygen consumption at a time. This is basically kind of your aerobic capacity. So it can be a really good mechanism for challenging your cardiovascular capacity without having to do long-term endurance cardio. So once you've decided which style you're going to do, either the Tabata, which is a two to one, work rest, but it should really only be 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest, or a hit style in a one to five ratio of 10 seconds of work, 50 seconds of rest. Once you've decided what you're going to do, you must be doing movements that are not so complex that you're not going to hurt yourself, but can do maximal exertion. So when you see all these hit workouts that all these like Instagram people will put up and they're doing all these fancy weird BOSU or things with cable machines or stuff like that, that is probably not a true HIT workout because something cannot be done maximally because you're at risk of injury or something is just too involved. I usually like to point that out whenever I see my clients want to do this or that, or they want to go do one of these classes that we'll talk about here in a second. And I'll kind of explain to them that you're not going to get that same HIT reaction because what you're doing is too complex. Therefore, I do usually say simple is better for most of these because you're just going to really want to pick like squat jumps and do that for 10 seconds of work, 50 seconds of rest, not get fancy. You're going to get a full body workout from doing just squat jumps. Some more examples would be like skate lunges, mountain climbers. I don't like burpees, so I'm just not going to recommend them, but a lot of people do do them. If you can properly perform those, those would be great for you to do with these. However, typically when people get exhausted, I don't like the like risk versus reward ratio of burpees, which is why a large majority of us like fitness professionals do not stand behind burpees. Another great one I like to use for a lot of my clients who do hit is kettlebell swings because they are a fantastic way to challenge full body work and weight it. So adding weight to it versus just doing body weight. But again, please learn proper kettlebell swing form. I am not a fan of the American kettlebell swing where you swing it over your head. There's a lot more risk for injury with shoulders because a lot of people aren't mechanically well suited for swinging a heavy bell over their head in my experience. (laughs) And again, I'm speaking towards gen pop. If you're more conditioned and you have a athletic past, this advice doesn't apply to you the same. But the reason that you're having an extended rest for hit, like true hit, is that is what allows your ATP PC system the time it needs to replenish the energy stores, which should allow you to perform these exercises more intensely and with a lot higher quality to prevent injury. So that is why you really must have the proper rest periods during true hit. define again what a micro workout is. So it's simply just a shorter, less time consuming workout 
think something like 10 to 20 minutes versus 60 to 75 minutes. While they can be more intense, they are shorter and they don't have to be as uh, intricate as longer workouts would be. So they can be done on their own or you can always add in a couple of them back to back throughout your day um, or break them apart into your day. That's another popular thing a lot of people like to do. So they'll do like a 15 minute in the morning and a 15 minute in the afternoon, something like that. And interestingly enough, a lot of people will correlate time with results. Um, micro workouts done the right way can actually produce the results you want while building your endurance in the process. And that's kind of like, what, how is that even possible? And we're going to chat about that. So funny enough, um, the studies on doing short bout exercise versus continuous bout. So a longer expenditure of time, this study and the concept has been around since the late nineties, actually, it's probably been around a little bit longer than that, but one particular study that kind of really brought this to attention was one by Jackick, Wing, Butler, and Robertson that was in 1995. So like I was saying that it's funny that TikTok is bringing stuff back around. Clearly, this is not a brand new research area that people have been kind of exploring, trying to help as many people as possible, like adhere to workouts. And so like you guys have heard me many times before, if you've been listening to my podcast for a while or you coach with me, adherence is the common dom- denominator for anybody's success in health, pretty much. If you can adhere to something that is health promoting in your life, you are going to win the game. Um, I like to kind of give that concept of there's the game of life. The goal is to keep playing as long as possible. It's not to just succeed in like one short little thing here and there, because then you're going to be like SOL when it comes down to like, okay, now what do you do after that? You know? So that kind of correlates to like why I'm not a huge fan of bodybuilding because like you will push your body to that limit. And then what else afterwards, you know? So being as consistent with your health goals as possible is how you win at the game of life because you keep playing. You don't basically lose or bonk out, whatever. So with that concept in mind, micro workouts are a great way for a lot of people who have those routines that don't give a lot of leeway for long format workouts, an opportunity to succeed at staying consistent and staying adhering to some sort of fitness. So in that specific study, for those nerds out there like me who like to uh, know a little bit about how they determined this stuff. Researchers wanted to kind of determine the length of the exercise correlated to success and adherence. So they instructed two groups of women to exercise five days per week over 20 weeks. Um, They steadily increased from 20 minutes to 40 minutes per day. And group A performed the exercise in one session, all of them. And then group B broke it up into 10 minute chunks throughout their day. So the group who did multiple shorter sessions per day reported exercising on more days and for longer in total than the group instructed to do longer sessions. Group B also reported slightly greater weight loss results. So that isn't because those workouts were essentially better for them. In comparison, both are equally effective. However, having more consistency means overall you're burning more calories, building more muscle, muscle burns more calories, and you're more consistent and you're challenging your body consistently daily, that would put you in a position where you are more consistently in a deficit, therefore resulting in greater weight loss. So I found this concept um, to actually work very well for a lot of like my clients during the pandemic or a lot of my mom clients. Um, And even clients I've had that simply only have 30 minutes or 40 minutes in their day to devote to workouts. And that's even still on the longer end because you can totally reap benefits from only 10 or 15 minute workouts, which is fascinating. And so this is something I have absolutely seen work really well for plenty of clients, especially females, and especially the ones who aren't very motivated, I would say, to... um, follow a routine consistently. And oftentimes, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of us might think about like a mini workout and be like, okay, well, if it's only 10 or 15 minutes, I can do it. Like whatever. Versus, uh, I just like can't take the time to drive to the gym, do all the things. 
spend a whole hour and then drive back. You know what I mean? Sometimes that's like totally unappealing for a lot of people. And so maybe just having a couple of kettlebells and some dumbbells and bands and busting out a quickie like 15 minute workout twice a day or at least once a day might actually be your jam. Like that might actually be something that could work better for you. So one of my top hot takes on it would just be that that is a really good strategy for those of you who have busy schedules. A strategy for that, if that's something that you want to implement into your workouts or your work life, is look at your work schedule. So if you're somebody who uses Google Calendar or however you organize your life, um, time block in when you're going to do that little workout. Make sure obviously you have your equipment and stuff, especially this is easier for people who work out from home or if this is in the morning before you go to work or after work, it can be really easy just to be like, I have time for 20 minutes of working out, but you have to put it in your calendar and you have to stick to it. So my best tip would be time block it in every day when you want to go spend the time for it so that you hold yourself accountable. You see it in there, you know, you can do it and you put in the time to just get it done. If you're like me and you know that time just gets away from you when you don't have things structured in your calendar, this is an essential tip for you because um, I have to put in like gym into the time zones in my week where I know it'll fit and then I just make it part of my day. It's just something that I have to do in the day, just like showing up to my clients, just like going to the grocery store. I go in when I have it on my calendar. So That might be kind of like type A for you, but maybe you you might benefit if you try it, you know, find what works for you with how you can fit it into your schedule. Because if there's something I've learned over the years, it's that we have a tendency to jumble up our days in our head and just think, I just, I just simply have no time for it. Well, micro workouts are a great way for you to be like, yes, I do. I do have 15 minutes, you know, and the only thing that you also want to make sure is that you aren't trying to be too rigid again. So while you can make it fit into your busy schedule, if something gets in the way that is just impossible for you to avoid, especially if you have children, you know, things like that, you can't always predict what they're going to do, right? So it's okay if you have to like skip that or maybe push it into the evening if you planned on doing it in the morning. I will say majority of the time, especially for adults over the age of 25, Morning workouts will give you a lot more clarity, focus, and energy for your day than evening workouts. So I tend to recommend you try to do your movement in the morning, possibly before you do any work. And it tends to, I actually think they did some studies on it that I had read in the past where they did find better brain function in the morning after you got blood flowing movement. So either a leisure walk in the morning for 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, or a mini workout for 10, 15 or 20 minutes. So going back to looking at your four week cycle, so to speak, your first two weeks are your follicular phase. Your last two weeks are your luteal phase. If we spread them out into a little bit wider scope, Your first phase is your menses, your menstruation phase. That's when you're bleeding. That's the first day one through seven at most. Your next week is going to be your follicular phase. That's when you're starting to get the rise in estrogen and you're preparing for ovulation. Then you have ovulatory phase, which is going to be when you're ovulating, which is your highest peak of estrogen. And then progesterone is going to start kicking in. And then you get your fourth week, which is your luteal phase, which is that PMS week. Uh, It's the week as your progesterone is spiking and your estrogen is dropping and it's kind of increasing that lining in your uterus as well as changing your mood and your energy levels because it's going to also prep you to shed that lining and have your bleeding again. So those are kind of the four phases of your cycle. When you look at your own cycle, you really want to see 28 to 30 days. Anything shorter than that would be good for you to try to work on lengthening it so you have a really healthy long luteal phase. But it's not necessarily unhealthy to be slightly shorter than a 28-day. But especially as you get older, like past your mid-30s, those days will tend to change because you are not probably ovulating as much as your ovarian reserve is depleting. That's just normal for getting older. 
So if we're looking at your first, let's call your first week, your menses week, your bleeding week, either you're the person who's completely incapacitated, you really don't want to do anything at all, you feel really crampy, lethargic, etc. This is the best time for you to just take a chill pill if you're that person. You're going to want to do something that's called LIS, low intensity steady state cardio. This is walking, not really getting your heart rate over 135 beats per minute is a good way to gauge that. Yoga, stretching, breathing, meditation, really low impact stuff is probably your best move if you're a person who gets a really crappy period. If you're a person like for me, for example, at this stage, I've mostly recovered a healthy cycle for myself post birth control. But for me, I'm actually not that incapacitated during my bleed part. Um, Oftentimes, my first day of bleeding is pretty uncomfortable. Sometimes day two is the heaviest, so to speak. But regardless, throughout all of that, I'm usually good with tampon and aligner. And I don't feel uncomfortable going to the gym and weightlifting. Sometimes it actually makes me feel better. So if you're a person who's in that kind of category, you don't necessarily feel like you need to lay out on the couch or have a heating pack, then you are probably a person who will do well to weight lift still on that day. I usually would say, especially for a lot of my clients, um, on your bleed day, you can actually still lift pretty heavy on those days. However, you're going to want to go for longer rest periods in between. So we're not trying to overexert yourself in the sense of going heavy and fast. We're trying to look for heavier, like 80 to 90% capacity max and 75 to 90 second rest. So we're looking at like a minute to a minute and a half of rest, at least in between sets. However, as far as cardio goes, if you're one of those people, I would still keep it towards something like list cardio, just so that you can let your body kind of do the busy activity it's doing internally so that it doesn't feel like externally, it's also overexerting. Um, Some people may think like, oh, but like, isn't heavy weightlifting overexerting, not always. And you actually get a little bit of spike of um, human growth hormone when you're on your period, allegedly. So you can actually put a little bit of that part of your face to use. If you're a person who is totally fine and feels pretty good uh, during that bleed cycle, my cycle usually lands around three to four days. I'm usually in and out of it pretty consistently around that time. Um, and again, I don't get a ton of crampings and such, uh, which a good majority of my clients also have this experience. So then you're heading into the follicular phase. So you're like going day seven into, uh, day 16 or so. This is when you're leading into ovulation. Ovulation usually happens around day 14 or so. So your estrogen is increasing. This means your energy is increasing. This is where we kind of get that vitality vibe. This is the perfect time to go hard in the paint. This is when you actually are just following your programming to a T if you're strength training, which I highly recommend always, all the time, because the lean muscle is much more efficient and effective on the female body than cardio only. You want to make sure that you're going to listen to how much you can exert during this time. When you are going towards ovulation, especially on ovulation day, that's peak week. That's when you have the most energy, the most strength. It's the best time to put hit workouts in if you want to do those, higher intensity spins, heavy weight lifting, shorter rest periods if you wanted to. Think Orange Theory Fitness. This is the only time of your month you should do Orange Theory Fitness. <laughs> then you go into your luteal phase. Once you're into your luteal phase, you are going to start feeling that downshift. Your progesterone starting to increase, your estrogen is decreasing. Therefore, you start to feel a little bit lower energy. This is like when we talked about the nutrition stuff. This is when your carb cravings come in. It's also a good time to kind of put those extra carbs to use. However, your body is going to also use those extra carbs. That's why it's asking for them because it's about to shed the lining and bleed. You don't really want to overdo it with activity either. And so I usually suggest to my clients, shift yourself down into that 60 to 75% capacity with your weightlifting and cardio. I would adjust to like miss. So moderate intensity, steady state, or begin the cycle of your low intensity, steady state walking or yoga. This would be a better time for like Hatha yoga, 
your follicular phase with your ovulation is going to be better for power vinyasa or something like that. Then as you start to reach that day 24 until bleed, this might actually be your most PMSE phase. I mean, this is when PMS starts to happen for real. I know for myself, I actually feel worse on these days than I actually do on my bleed days. So therefore, I tend to actually treat those days a little bit more like bleed day advice, where I do pretty much just walking, stretching, rehab stuff, recovery, and or nothing. You know, it's okay to do nothing, (laughs) which is actually really weird and hard for a lot of us. A lot of us have this kind of all or nothing perfection mentality where we do not think there's any room for nothing. And actually almost being as perfect as you can to listening to your body sometimes requires nothing. That might be tricky to wrap your head around, but I definitely want to invite you to experience it for yourself and try to think about how your body feels when you actually do let it rest. Because sometimes we're in this kind of wired and tired phase or we're just overexerted in general. A lot of us have this typical pattern for what we would call adrenal fatigue, which is kind of a blanket statement for getting a huge cortisol dip around that noon to 2 p.m. time frame. And that's a sign from our body that things are dysregulated. We are working too hard. We're not giving ourselves a phase of rest and digest. <laughs> that's a big slap in the face sign, like take your time for yourself. And if you are a naturally cycling female, This is really important for you to heed this time frame between day 24 until the end of your bleed period. Not necessarily that you need to not do anything at all those all those days, but those are the most important days for you to capitalize on resting and listening to your body and what it needs. This is for Judy who wants a booty, okay? You really want to prepare your mind that you are going to be in this hypertrophy phase. So hypertrophy is where we're trying to get the muscle to grow. That phase should last at least three to six months minimum. If you aren't putting in effort for at least three months, you're not going to see the results that you want. Your body needs to go through multiple cycles, not just menstrual cycles, but multiple weeks of loading so that it feels like it can adapt because all of this is we're asking your glute muscle to have an adaptation to constant load. This is why we get sore because we're tearing apart the muscle and then it's trying to repair itself. And in that zone, a bunch of different acids and things are released as well as a period of time where you need that recovery so that that muscle can repair from the nutrients you feed it to grow. So you need time under your belt. A lot of my clients want to come and see me for like half a year or one year and have these really nice, big, shapely glutes. It's very rare for that to ever happen, especially depending on where they're at with their nutrition, where they're at with their stress levels, where they're at with their genetics, etc. I will say I have seen the best results for most of my clients once they hit the two year mark. And some people might be like, oh my gosh, that's forever. But Time under tension and longevity of time under tension is what's going to build a muscle. And that's what's necessary for building bigger glutes. You're going to need that muscle maturity, we kind of call it, where essentially at this point, because I've been weightlifting since I was 18, I have now 11 years under my belt of strength training my glutes and my leg muscles. So I don't have to work as hard now to keep those muscles around. If I wanted to grow them though, I would have to work super hard because I've been having this glute muscle for a while. And the final bit here, what exercises would I strongly suggest that you implement at least two times a week, ideally four times a week, if you're really trying to grow them faster and larger? And I'm going to kind of list them in order of moderately glute active or glutes are involved moderately to glutes are very involved. Number one is going to kind of surprise you because everybody thinks it's the major glute building workout. However, especially after they've done literal studies on it, squats are towards the bottom for me. Squats are a very quad dominant exercise. You're going to be working a lot more of your core and your quads than your glutes Glutes will definitely be involved. However, they are not the most involved in that movement pattern. Thus, I have put them towards the 
top of this list in the sense that they aren't going to grow your glutes as much as what we get to towards the end. So next would be any variation of a deadlift because you should really be using your glutes at the top of this movement to drive power and strength because they are your biggest muscle group. Specifically, sumo deadlifts can be one of the best for growing your gluteus maximus as they allow you to get a really good contraction because your toes are abducted outward, which is a good position for engaging your glute muscles a little bit more than normal. But any variation of a deadlift is another hinge pattern. It's just standing up. So that's a great way to grow some glute muscle. Next would be cable or machine glute kickback. So some gyms have the actual machine where you kind of stand with your chest against a pad and you can kind of set whatever weight you want and you kick back against the pad. My best tip is that you perform that similarly to how you would do a cable machine kickback where you put the ankle attachment on the cable at the lowest point of the cable machine. You're going to want to kind of soften your standing leg and get your torso a little lower so you can really isolate and kind of donkey kick backwards driving through your heels. You're going to get a lot more engagement in your glutes that way and it's one of the greatest ways that you can grow glutes at a higher volume, meaning more reps. Some of the other more isolated movements would be like a leaning back hip abduction or a leaning forward hip abduction, as well as frog pumps, which if you don't know what those are, just Google it on YouTube, you'll see them, (laughs) as well as banded elevated hip ridges with your feet up. Those are also going to be very isolating in a different variation of the specific movement pattern, but the strength training exercises that I would top recommend for this would be a hip thrust with a barbell. And there's so many different ways you could set up this movement because the hardest thing for a lot of people is just trying to get into position because you are usually leaning up against a heavy bench so it doesn't move and you are kind of rolling a barbell up over your hips with a pad on it. You need a pad on it. It's going to be so uncomfortable. And if you don't need a pad, you're not lifting heavy enough. (laughs) And you're going to want to make sure that you are in a position where you are moving in a perfect hinge, like I like to say, a bind on a book, that your torso stays connected in the motion of when you're dropping your butt and pushing your hips up. And your chin should always be tucked down, ribs stay tucked down, looking at your belly button the entire time of doing the barbell hip thrust. You should not ever be looking up at the ceiling doing a heavy weighted hip thrust. However, you can look up at the ceiling if you're doing single leg, body weight, high volume hip thrusts or with a lighter dumbbell, etc. That's totally okay to look up at the ceiling. However, heavy lifting, you put your low back at risk with fatigue if you look at the ceiling. So that's one of the major things I always see a lot of girls doing wrong at the gym is they're doing the staring at the ceiling version and sometimes arching their back. That is absolutely putting you at risk for a lower back injury and definitely stay in your heels with this motion as well. Do not go into your toes. Now there's some other things you can do like feet high and narrow on an angled leg press or Bulgarian split squats with your foot further out so you're getting a lot more glute isolation, which I love. Everybody hates them. Not everybody. There are some people who like them too. But those are some really great other versions of exercises to isolate glutes. But the king of all exercises for glute growth is always going to be a barbell hip thrust. So if I had to say kind of a hierarchy of how you should structure your workout, I would start with your banded work. Do at least two sets of three to four different band exercises to activate your glutes. A lot of my clients, when they skip this, they tend to either kind of get injured or they report back that they felt so much weaker in their workout. This is because those muscles were not turned on properly. Easiest way to turn them on is with your band work. So never skip your band work. Keep them in your gym bag. I always recommend have a gym bag with you when you go to the gym. And then after you finish that dynamic activation, we like to call it, you're going to want to switch right into the exercises that are going to require the most energy for you. So this is where you're going to do your heaviest lifting. So let's say you are working on barbell hip thrusts. You're going to want to do about three to five sets in the rep range of six to 12. So you're going to get a good amount of time under tension and pushing heavier weight. So you're really challenging that muscle group 
for about three to five sets. And then you can sprinkle in two to four other isolation movements, such as let's say you add in the elevated foot hip bridges and some leaning back hip abduction on the hip abduction machine. This is that machine where you're kind of like, don't want to make eye contact with other people. And you can also do walking lunges, things like that. So you always want to stack the most effort with the biggest compound lift right after that dynamic activation, in my opinion. And then you're going to want to do some of that accessory burnout stuff to put more time under tension, a lot more, a little more volume on your glutes. And then you're going to make sure that you do some cool down stuff because your body's going to regret it if you don't do your foam rolling or some of your static stretching at the end. Sometimes too, a lot of people like to do a cool down walk, like five to 10 minutes on the treadmill and then do a little static stretching. But I totally recommend that is the best workout programming for general glute growing. And I hope that all of that was helpful for you. And I know that it has been exponentially beneficial for all of my clients who have put in the efforts and push the weight to really change their physique by adding strength specifically to those nice booty muscles. The dark sides of bodybuilding competitions, the pressure to conform. So look, if you think about this concept, you are a female, you're training for a usual cycle of training is like 15 weeks or more. And then a cut can go anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. So you're in a bulk phase um, with, if you've listened to my previous uh, macronutrient episodes, which is all of May, definitely recommend that series. You have to be in a caloric surplus to add muscle. It's very, very rare for females to add muscle while being in a deficit because our bodies don't have as much testosterone as the male body does. Testosterone kind of changes the body's ability to add lean muscle and recover and lean out, so lose body fat simultaneously, than the female body. That's why you often see a lot of physique competitors and even bikini competitors taking testosterone supplementation while competing. Um, This is why you tend to see a more hardened jaw, more square hips, uh, more masculine features in general, because they tend to use performance enhancing drugs, talk more about that in a sec, um, but also testosterone because testosterone gives an advantage for muscle building and retention. So when you're going through the cycle, you're going to be bulking, quote unquote, adding muscle. This is a typically softer looking phase, but like a lot more muscular because you have to have body fat and you have to have a good amount of water and carbohydrates to build in and uh, recover that muscle. So then you go into a deficit phase. The longer the deficit is, the harder, but also you might maintain more lean muscle because you're not going to go into really low calorie zone too fast. Shorter the cut is, the more intense it is, and the more opportunity to lose lean muscle mass while cutting fat. So a more modern approach to cutting for a competition tends to be a longer drawn out cut phase, but there are still people who tend to do the hardcore eight weeks or shorter kind of cut phase, which is honestly kind of insane, but that is something that some people prefer to do because a longer cut, like as a lot of my clients know who have done deficits with me, specific deficits with calories and reduction slowly, slowly, it is so tough to stick to like a 12 week or 10 week or longer um, deficit, but that is uh, just the differences between the two. So Once they go into this, those last uh, four weeks are often like hell weeks. You're starving. You can't sleep because you're hungry. You're trying to cut as much body fat off as possible. And you're doing oftentimes old fashioned bodybuilding training would put you through a lot of cardio at the end as well. Some of the modern approaches are more science-based and they don't put your body under as much stress. Um, Some people also do like water restriction and different things like that to try to get as quote unquote dry as possible. Um, There's a ton of different techniques of interesting things that people do to try to reduce the water retention on their body to see, we call it looking drier, meaning that you are really lean and cut for stage. This is a very temporary time, but it's something that is worth noting what it takes to get there. Once you go through that whole process, you compete, then you either reverse diet out 
or some people just binge and kind of go through like their bulk immediately right after and do the cycle all over again because there's multiple competitions every year and a lot of people because they devote their life to it will continually follow this cycle for several years for several competitions uh, so hopefully that's under uh, a little more helpful for you to understand um, the process of competing and what it looks like and what it takes but because of uh, you being in this position where you are going to stand on stage next to a bunch of other women and kind of get picked out. <laughs> I always joke, and again, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but um, when people have asked me like, why have you never bodybuilding competed or any of that kind of stuff? Um, I'll usually say, I don't really have any interest in standing on stage like a bunch of cattle and getting picked to see which meat looks the best, you know, because that's literally what competitions are. You're really just comparing yourself and your body against a bunch of other fantastically fit, gorgeous women as well. And it can make you really have an immense amount of pressure to conform to this specific aesthetic that's ideal for winning the judges' um, votes. And it is often what makes women have to do things like get breast implants or use performance enhancing drugs um, because it has a lot of negative impact on your body image, your self-esteem and your mental health altogether because of that. What are very specific considerations that you should have with understanding the scale. So first off, I'm going to repeat it again. The scale is literally measuring your gravity, your gravitational pull here on earth. With that said, the more mass you have, the heavier that number will be. The less mass you have, the lower that number will be. More mass in general is not innately unhealthy. So it very much depends on a lot of factors. And that goes everything from your genetics, because a lot of ethnicities have health at higher body fat percentages and others have health at lower body fat percentages. Some people, like if you ever have ever had that friend who can eat a burrito and like seven beers and stay tiny, that's a whole different metabolism. That's called an ectomorph. There's three body types that we kind of generalize people into. Sometimes you can be a hybrid of one or the other or two rather. There's mesomorph who is basically going to be Somebody who can add muscle pretty easily, lose fat if they really put their mind to it relatively easily, and keep weight off generally well. And then there's people who are endomorphs, who are usually like shorter, stockier body types. They can add fat really fast, but they can also add muscle really fast, but they have a hard time losing fat. Ectomorphs are the type who have a really hard time putting on muscle, but can keep fat off very easily. And it typically, typically correlates to your genetics and your metabolism based off of uh, your environment, nature, and nurture. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. But um, I will note, despite popular opinion of some scientific uh, voices that came out and said, oh, being obese is genetic, yes and no. Again, you can have genetics that are encouraging you to be a higher body fat percentage if several generations ahead of you were obese. However, you can absolutely prevent obesity for yourself by lifestyle because lifestyle is what kind of pulls the trigger. So for everybody who kind of wants to believe that it's in their genetics that they're obese, not necessarily. It's typically because your environment encouraged obesity, aka a high body fat percentage, and then your lifestyle continued it. So that's something that I think is really important for people to understand because it's not a personal thing. It's actually just that, yes, genetics can become altered now that we've had more and more generations of really high body fat percentage humans. But is it going to be a death sentence for you? No. Will it be harder for you to keep fat off if you do have some of those genetic cofactors? Yes, but it's not end of everything for you. You're not just going to basically be born and step into obesity. It's, it's again, very much related to your mother's gut health and how they raised you and your family, what you ate as you got older, and how it set your metabolism up based off of your environment. So that's really important to understand because I think um, I got that question a lot earlier this year when that scientist or doctor or whatever came out on television and said that. And uh, it's, it's a lot to do with your environment, less to do with just your genetics. But 
that would be an internal consideration that can impact the scale. You might be a person who trends on the higher body fat percentage. So that's where your ethnicity comes in. It's very important to understand that because that is what the scale of BMI does not take into account. So I'm going to do a quick mini tangent of why the BMI is stupid. <laughs> and I've actually literally told one of my male clients whose doctor kept continually telling him that his BMI meant he was obese when he was a six foot two, 235 pound man with only 18% body fat and a lot of muscle. So that made him heavier. So if you don't know what BMI is, the body mass index is a very easy generalization for Western medicine to get an idea of a person's potential health. It's just general. Most of the time now, it's just used for data for large populations because everybody who has a license has their height and their weight on it, right? A lot of the times the weight is not accurate. <laughs> like mine is actually 10 pounds less than I actually am now and that I've been since I got the original license, but whatever. That's the case for quite a few people. So again, it's very generalizy. And that's really what we use it in the census for kind of getting an idea of the general population's health. It has so much room for mistake. There's an issue with using BMI since it is your weight divided by your height. And it has, it has so many flaws, guys. <laughs> Basically, the issue with that is for my client, I'll use that example again, who is 6'2", 235, 18% body fat, lots of muscle. He technically is in a very healthy, strong body position for a adult male. But because his weight in relativity to his height is still higher, quote unquote, he is considered obese on the BMI scale, which he clearly is not. He had very healthy internal markers and that just was ridiculous. And I even told him to tell his physician if she called him obese when he was at his physical that year to tell her that she was dumb <laughs> for bothering to say that. And he did. He actually did. And uh, she was just like, I know I'm just required to say that. And I'm like, why though? Because it makes, we have tons and tons of data now that state how harmful it is more than beneficial to call a person a generalized term that society has really tainted by saying like, oh, you're obese, oh, you're overweight, you know, you're a slob, you know, all these it's horrible connotations that we put on people with higher body fat percentages that aren't necessarily true. And then we like sit down with like your trusted practitioner who is a person that typically everybody puts all of their uh, worth and understanding of their health in, even though they really shouldn't. <laughs> um, but naturally we do. And then they sit down and tell you like, oh, you're obese. And then you leave the office feeling like crap, right? Who has been called overweight or obese by their doctor before and been like, okay. And half the time they're just like, oh, you just really lost some weight or you need to lose some weight. I've had so many clients, guys, where I want to tear my hair out when I hear what their doctors tell them. I've literally had three clients specifically get eating disorders in college or early adulthood for poor advice from their doctor. Because you think that, oh, this is the person that has the utmost understanding of health. I have to trust them. And then like one of them was stressed out of her mind in law school and her doctor literally said, uh, and she was getting edema from it, which is water weight retention, like unex uh, unexplicable water retention. And uh, her doctor said, oh, you're just getting fat because you're overeating because you're stressed when she really wasn't. All she was doing was studying and actually under eating. So then she under ate more because she trusted her doctor and thought that she was actually gaining fat when in reality, she was just swelling with water because her adrenals and kidneys were imbalanced, yada, yada, all that kind of stuff. Because the female body has very unique things that it can do when it's under high stress for a chronic period of time. And that was so irresponsible because then my poor client dealt with an eating disorder for like the last several years of college until she realized that that doctor was wrong. And this is not the first time that's happened. I've had so many, so many clients have horrible experiences. Like actually one of my clients earlier this summer, she went to go have her physical and her doctor said, so have you always been chubby? She literally called her chubby. And it like, it like breaks my heart that people have the audacity just because they have a PhD behind their name to say things like that to people when they don't understand that a lot of this can mean an eating disorder for somebody. It can mean a whole bunch of horrible, horrible, horrible things. 
and they just kind of throw these words around and use outdated measures of health like the BMI. Um, and frankly, I think we should be throwing BMI out the window with doctor's visits because unless you're trying to use it for generalized data for people's health for some sort of census study or some crap, we shouldn't be using BMI. And it was literally developed in the 19th century by a Belgian astronomer, and he wanted to define the average man, but his average man that he used for that scale was a European white male, and he definitely didn't take into account different genetic differences, and he kind of just scaled the female's ideal BMI slightly higher than the male's. So it's not even actually based off of what is truly the healthier body fat percentages and BMI for women. So... I like, that's exactly why I have to go off on this tangent because yes, BMI is BS. Yes, it can give you some general ideas because I'm not saying that somebody who is above 50% body fat won't come back with a really high BMI, but generally you can take a look at somebody like somebody who is trained to understand body fat percentage. You can look at somebody and if you understand their genetic or ethnicity background, and their current state of being, you can really understand whether or not a person is truly unhealthy and it should be a concern to bring up to them or not. Because I can, it's a weird talent of mine, but I can basically look at somebody and guess nearly exactly their body fat percentage because I've been around so many bodies and I've learned. And for me, I really like to see women between 18% and 36%. Some ethnicities are actually extremely healthy all the way up to 40%. When we start to go above 40%, we usually start to see a lot of health issues arise. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But I would say if you can avoid BMI, if you can ignore a lot of the things that your doctor is going to generically say to you when you go in, if you have an MD or a PCP or whatever, anything Western medicine, they're going to use the BMI and they'll probably use words that are hurtful or not ideal. And I would just put on blinders, ignore them during that part because BMI is dumb. All right, I really hope that you enjoyed these clips, learned something new or got some concept hammered into your brain a little bit better. <laughs> and if you had any thoughts that you wanted to share, like screenshot and share this episode to your story or tag me or even just reach out to me, DM me anytime. I'm open to chat with you. I love to chat. So I'd love to hear if this was helpful. And at the same time, definitely share with any of your girls that are scared of weightlifting or new to it or want some more tips to do it better. Maybe they're not making the glute muscle progress that they thought, or maybe they are kind of following way too many bodybuilders and don't really know kind of the smoke and mirrors that goes into that entire industry in general. And like I said before, that scale episode is maybe an episode everybody should listen to, especially every female from 15 to 55 or even more. <laughs> but all to say, I really hope that this was a great best of episode for you and that you enjoyed it. And should you feel called, I'd love if you gave us a five-star rating if you want to, or maybe throw a little comment in there, share why you love the podcast in general, and or just give us a little five star on Spotify if you're a listener of Le Spotify like me. Celebrate your strength and nourishment, Rebel. I hope that you walk with confidence and I will catch you next week on another episode of Rebel Wellness. If you are still listening, thank you for tuning in to our latest episode of Rebel Wellness. If you've been enjoying our conversations around health, fitness, and wellness, I have some exciting news for you. So if you would love to join our newsletter group, you can join us on coachkales.com or you can join my Stan store at stan.store backslash kales, K-A-I-L-E-S. And that's an awesome opportunity for you to snag some freebies that I've created, including a macro hack grocery list that is gonna help you kind of design a custom grocery list especially for following macronutrients, because as you know, if you didn't listen to my macros in May series, I would go back to those episodes because it has been a game changer for so many of our listeners for getting more on top of how to shape their physique and their health goals with the food they're eating. So 
Don't sleep on that. Go get your free download. S-T-A-N, like Stan the Man, stan.store backslash kills. And you can also join our newsletter from that. And if you would like to reach out to me, chat, maybe work together, you can also contact me through my website, coachkales.com. And I would absolutely love you to join our Rebel Wellness Podcast Instagram, which is at Rebel Wellness Podcast. And you can also join my flagship coaching page at Coach by Kales. That's where it all began. That's where I share the most um, kind of custom to what I do work on specifically with my clients on that page. So join that one. It's all feminine wellness focused and I share some great stuff, some goofy stuff, things that you just don't want to miss as well as healthy recipes and things and easy recipes because we all kind of need some easy grab and go things, don't we? So I would love you to join both those pages as you'll be joining a community of like-minded females who are all committed to living their best lives. So hit that follow button. And I would love if you felt the need to share and rate our podcast. We would love that. Anyways, thanks for listening. And I hope to catch you next Sunday or say hello on the gram.